Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 191 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. King Philip's War is one of those events that appears in history books about colonial New England over and over and over again. It was an important event, and as such, many historians have explored the war and why it happened from 1676 to the present. So, when you have an event that's been as studied as King Philip's War has been, is there anything new that we can learn about it by re-examining it in our own present day? Are there perhaps any new angles or strategies that we can use to view all the evidence we have about the war that might lead us to form new conclusions and new ideas about the event? Could it be that there are still records from the past that historians have overlooked that could tell us something new about the war? Lisa Brooks, an associate professor of English and American Studies at Amherst College, believes the answers to all of these questions is yes. And today, She's going to help us re-examine and rethink what we know about King Philip's War by introducing us to new people, new ways we can look at known historical sources, and to different ways we can think about what we know about this event, with details from her book, Our Beloved Kin, A New History of King Philip's War. Now, during our reinvestigation of King Philip's War, Lisa reveals details about King Philip's War and when it took place, what caused the war and who the war was really between, and how King Philip's War and the stories of its lesser-known participants can help us better understand early American history. But first, we're meeting up in July. Specifically, we're meeting up on Sunday, July 8 at 10 a.m. in Boston for a two-hour tour that will highlight Boston's involvement in the American Revolution. And then, on Saturday, July 21, we're going to meet up in Cleveland. Now, I'm still working out the details of the Cleveland meetup, but I'll let you know when those details are set. So in the meantime, I've posted links, dates, and times to both of these meetups in the show notes and in your Ben Franklin's World app. So please be sure to check them out because I'd really love to meet you in both Cleveland and Boston. Okay, are you ready to travel back in time to the late 17th century to discover more about King Philip's War? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an associate professor of English and American Studies at Amherst College. She's an expert in early American literature, history, geography, and indigenous studies. She's the author of numerous articles and two books. Her most recent book, Our Beloved Kin, A New History of King Philip's War, reframes the historical landscape of what we know about King Philip's War. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Lisa Brooks. Thank you so much, Liz. Thanks for having me on the podcast. So, Lisa, as you know, We're here to discuss King Philip's War, and I think a really natural place for us to start would be to talk about the basics of the event. Would you tell us about this war, what it was over, and who it was between? King Philip's War is most often seen as a conflict between the indigenous people and the recent settlers of New England, and It took place between 1675 and 1676, and it began with a conflict between Wampanoags led by Metacom, also known as Philip, and the settlers of Plymouth. And I think it's important to note that this conflict took place not too long after the first arrival of the settlers at Plymouth in 1620. So from 1620 to 1675 is not really that long a time when we think about the long histories here in the Indigenous Americas. And one of the things that I like to point out is that the conflict was not called King Philip's War during its time, but rather it was called the Indian War or the First Indian War because there were many that followed afterwards. And sometimes historians or local folks here in New England see it as a kind of last conquest of the New England Indians, which is really kind of a false mythology around the war. 
but also sometimes it's seen as simply an indigenous rebellion or an indigenous resistance movement. And I think that also doesn't give us a complex enough picture of the conflict that broke out here. If the people at the time referred to the war as the First Indian War, how and when did it come to be known as King Philip's War? Historians have pointed to the origin point for calling it King Philip's War to Benjamin Church's narrative of the war, which really was kind of an as-told-to narrative conveyed by a military leader to his son decades after the war was over. And one of the things that this narrative does in naming the war after a single indigenous leader is that then the war can also end with the death of that leader, foreclosing the stories of indigenous resistance and diplomacy that continued long after the conclusion of the southern front of the war in southern New England. And Philip was an honored, revered, and significant indigenous leader in New England. However, He was not seen by Native people or even by the English, really, at the time as the sole leader of this movement. But really, the alliance that emerged during the war between Native nations was multifaceted. The alliance came up in multiple regions, and Philip was but one of many leaders who was part of that alliance. Now, when we look at the historiography of colonial New England, or All the books and articles historians have ever written about the colonial history of the region. King Philip's War is something that comes up, you know, quite a lot. So I wonder what drew you to this oft told story and what you wanted to know about this part of the region's history? That's a great question. And so the first thing I want to say is that I didn't set out to write a book about King Philip's War. As you noted, there have been many books about the war from its beginnings. People started to write histories of the war before the war was even done. And many, many historians over the centuries have taken up this topic. So my goal had never been to write a history of King Philip's War. That really emerged through a process of focusing on very particular stories and strands of research that all came together in this book. For one, I was focused on the story of James Printer, who was a Nipmuc man who, as a young student, was actually a scholar at the preparatory schools of Harvard College, and he worked on the first printing press in the colonies, which was housed in the Harvard Indian College, which is a history that many people don't know about. And I explore it in the book, but it was really delving into his story, his very complex story as a Nipmuc person who was really learning and living in multiple communities, including Nipmuc communities and including colonial English communities in the Massachusetts colony. And the war came to him as something that was unexpected and really disrupted the life of him and his family and his community. And I wanted to delve into those complex stories. I also was very much drawn into the story of Native women leaders, both before and during and after the war, especially the story of Widemu, who was a Wampanoag, Songsqua, a female leader and a relative of Phillips, who played a very prominent role in diplomacy before the war and also in alliance building during the war. But her story is often elided. And so I really wanted to see what happens when we focus on characters and historical figures like James and Wiedemu, whose stories often aren't heard. And at the same time, I was invested in thinking about some of the captivity narratives that came up during this time period, as well as what some historians call the northern front of the war in Wabanaki country. And as an Abenaki person myself, that's a history that I've been deeply embedded in for my whole adult life. And I was surprised as a very young person to realize that many people had very little awareness of this history during the colonial period. And so really, I was wanting to dig into these different stories. And of course, you know, they eventually all came together. You know, I'm curious in that you said one of your focuses was to tell this story or to investigate the story of King Philip's War through the eyes and voices of people, you know, we don't normally hear about like James Printer and Vitamu. And I'm curious if this led you to use any sources that historians who have covered King Philip's War in the past hadn't looked at before or never even thought to look at. Yes. In fact, that was one of the most 
interesting parts of this whole process was that when I first began this project, I really thought it was going to be about reading the sources through Indigenous studies lenses. And so reading the sources differently, because unlike some of the other projects I've worked on in the past, this is an era of history for which we have many, many sources and which we have reprints of sources and many people have written about. And so I did not think that this was going to be about the recovery of documents, for example, that had not seen the light of day. I really didn't imagine that that's what this project would be focused on, although I really like doing that kind of investigative work. But what I found is that by focusing on people like Widemu and James Printer and their kinship networks, their relations, very different sources came to light. And in fact, I found documents, for example, that pertain to Widemu's leadership both prior to and on the eve of the war that historians hadn't looked at before and that actually highlighted the very important role that she played in the war, but also the important role that Plymouth leaders recognized that she had, that they really had to deal with her as a leader, although they were reluctant to do so because of her gender. They understood that in her position of respect and leadership among her own Wampanoag community and other Native communities in the region, that they really had to deal with her. And that means that there's correspondence that exists that recognizes her leadership role, as well as her incredible efforts to try to protect Wampanoag land and Wampanoag people, again, both before the war, but then also very much during the war as well. So I guess in order for us to better fit Vitamu's story and that of James the Printer as well into our understanding of King Philip's War, we should probably start looking at the details of that war. You know, one of the origin stories of King Philip's War could be seen as a desire for land. And I wonder if you would tell us about the desire for land in colonial New England and whether the desire for land played any role in starting King Philip's War. Yes, the desire for land was quite intense, and particularly among the group of men known in Plymouth as the firstborn sons, which is in some ways the second generation of Plymouth settlers. So the first generation of Plymouth settlers had created deeds in which they basically were granting land to themselves and then to their sons in Wampanoag territory. And they had agreements with Wampanoag leaders that were about particular areas where they could have their settlements and negotiations around sharing space. So as this generation of firstborn sons came into adulthood and came into leadership positions, and particularly when that first generation passed on, the firstborn sons were really invested in claiming this land of New England as their own and also as their divine right. So both their right in terms of patrilineal inheritance from their fathers, but also their right in terms of a kind of inheritance from what they conceived of as a father god who had really, in their view, created this land for them. And of course, the problem with that is that land had been inhabited by Indigenous people for thousands of years, and Indigenous people continue to, and still today, continue to see these same lands as their homelands. So there were several things that happened that really created intense conflict. And one of the things was the firstborn son's efforts to try to claim land that Indigenous people were not willing to give up. And on the eve of war, really, they were looking to even get a hold of the last stronghold that Philip hold in his territory of Poconoket, which was the peninsula of Montauk, which is about where Bristol, Rhode Island is today, a little bit more than what that town is. But still, really, in many ways, historians have talked about the way that he and his community were hedged in on all sides because of the ways in which the Plymouth men had not only claimed land, but created deeds and also started to build settlements that pretty much surrounded that particular community. Wiedemu also worked pretty hard to try to retain her community lands at Potasset and try to protect them from both settlers from Plymouth and Rhode Island. So on the eve of war, you're really seeing a constraint and even further encroachment onto Indigenous lands. 
And this wasn't encroachment just by men who were settlers. It was also by their cattle. So this is a huge context for the war of the encroachment of pigs, cows, and horses on native lands and particularly on women's planting fields. You can see the complaints of indigenous leaders all over the court documents and other records from this period of native leaders trying to get the settlers to restrain their cattle. And settlers' basic response was to encourage native people to build fences around their cornfields rather than to fence in the animals. And this has a whole history to it, but there's a great historian named Virginia DeJohn Anderson who wrote a book called Creatures of Empire, where she basically argues that in some ways cattle were on the front lines of colonization. Of course, that's not to say that cattle had an intent to <laughs> colonize the land, but that this was actually a major piece of how colonization happened here. And I think it's really important to highlight that it was not just these firstborn sons, but an influx of settlers who were coming in to New England in general from England, right, and seeking more and more land. And so you had a demand from these firstborn sons based on their assumed rights of inheritance. You had a demand from new settlers coming in and seeking land on which to plant, on which to create ports for shipment, on which to create meadows where cattle could feed. And basically, you have an increase in population, plus you have an increasing sense of entitlement to these lands. And also, the third thing is, is that the particular planting techniques of the settlers differed vastly from the planting techniques of Native women, like the women in Wiedemann's community, because the plow agriculture that settlers in New England used actually depleted the soil. And so then once they depleted the soil, they then sought new lands to plant, which then further encroached on indigenous homelands, including women's planting fields. Thinking about women's planting fields is a really different way to think about colonial encroachment on Native American lands, because normally we think about European encroachment on hunting lands or fishing grounds or fur trapping sites. But we don't really think about Europeans as encroaching on Native American farmlands. And this sounds like it's an area that we really should be looking at because it demonstrates the toll encroachment took on women, whereas most of the other studies focus on discussions of encroachment on men. Absolutely. And to be clear, although women were the ones who were doing the bulk of the planting and the cultivating, this was a resource on which the entire community relied, right? They grew corn, beans, squash, sunchokes, sunflowers, pumpkins a whole variety of foods that sustained the entire community. So the encroachment on those planting fields was a major factor in the conflicts that arose. And yes, you are absolutely right that that context is often elided. And in fact, the narrators of the war often tried to elide that context. They were much more likely to try to portray Native people as kind of savages wandering through a wilderness, hunting and fishing, than as people who were, in their conceptualization, settled, agricultural people who were planting in particular places where they had planted for generations, because one of their arguments was that King Philip's war was a just war. And one of the foundations of that argument is that this was a war against barbarous people who were living a savage life in the wilderness, right? And so you see them actually trying to frame their narrative, so it's emphasizing that kind of portrayal, that stereotypical portrayal, but it's intentional, right? There's a reason for that. So being able to look at the documents and see how prominent the women's planting fields were and the complaints about the encroachment on those fields is very important. And it also shows the ways in which the war is not just something that is a male subject, right? That This war also was very much a war against the lands held by Native women. You know, when I think about wars over land in early America, my mind always conjures up land deeds. I mean, there were all sorts of dubious land deeds or precarious land deeds in all the colonies of early America. And so I'm wondering if land deeds played any role in the conflict that led to King Philip's War, because they really did play major roles in other conflicts. Oh, yes. In this period, deeds are some of the most prominent records we have. And as you suggest, they are very precarious. And we have to 
very carefully think about how we interpret them in multiple ways in which we can interpret them. As several historians have noted, they often are just a trace of the councils or negotiations that occurred on the ground. And so sometimes in the deeds, you can see the traces. For example, there are deeds that demonstrate the negotiation of both male and female leaders to retain particular rights for their communities which indicates a negotiation over how people are going to share space. And there are deeds where it's clear that settlers are being allowed the right by Native leaders to build their settlements in very particular places. And then there are deeds where it appears as if Native leaders are giving their consent to settlers to purchase exclusively vast tracts of their territory. One of my favorites is a series of deeds that comes up out of Rhode Island and in Narragansett territory, where the same group of Narragansett leaders ostensibly grants two entirely different groups of settlers the exact same vast tract of land. And in fact, this becomes part of a whole body of records that gets sent off to England by both groups fighting with each other over who has the right to those lands. So these things get really complicated really quickly. And so part of the historian's job is to try to get at the different possible interpretations of the documents, but also to try to understand what happened on the ground after those documents were signed or recorded to try to get a greater sense of what the context of the documents is. And moreover, one of the things that's very interesting about the early deeds is that they sometimes contradict narratives that come later, right? So the narratives that come later are often trying to create a narrative or a story that, for example, might justify war or might create a narrative of indigenous rebellion. And sometimes the earlier deeds and documents show things like the conflicts between neighboring colonies or even people within a colony that is alighted in later narratives. Now, from your book, Our Beloved Kin, it really seemed like there was one deed in particular that played an important role in the story of King Philip's War. And I wonder if you would tell us about this deed, which was dated July 26, 1651 and signed by Vitamu. Would you tell us about this deed and what it reveals about Vitamu's position within her native community? This is the earliest document, at least, that I found that mentions Widmo, and at the time she was known as Mumpum. And what's important about this deed is that it's a recognition and acknowledgement of Widmo's leadership role and also her rights and responsibilities as the Song Squaw, as the leader of Pacasset. And this acknowledgement is signed by three prominent male Wampanoag leaders. Samiquin, who's also known as Massasoit, the great sachem of the Wampanoags, who's probably one of the most well-known leaders in New England history. His son, Wamsada, who was Philip's brother, but also who would later marry Widamu. And also Tispaquin, who was another Wampanoag leader in the land called Namaskit. And he was also connected to this other leadership family through marriage. He was married to Wamsada and Philip's sister. And in this deed, they recognize Widamu as our beloved cousin and kinswoman. And this is not typical language for a New England deed. Usually, there's no reference to relationality unless it has to do with inheritance. And there certainly isn't language like beloved coming up in the usual deeds. But what's important is that it's really recognizing the kinship relationships and networks among these different leaders and their communities. And it's also recognizing her as the leader in her community's territory of Pacasset. And Samiquin, rightly, as a leader in the territory, is recognizing her as both a relative and as somebody who has jurisdiction in her own homeland, that he does not have power over her. And he also explicitly states that Plymouth Colony cannot claim power over her or her territories. And he also acknowledges, alongside the other leaders, that she has the right to permit particular settlers 
to live in her territory, that that is her jurisdiction and her community's jurisdiction. And as you can imagine, this is a really important document for demonstrating Wittemu's leadership in this area, but also the leadership that's combined between these leaders in Wampanoag territory and the kinship relationships that are at the foundation of leadership here. It seems like the language of kinship and jurisdiction in this deed must have played an interesting role in this story. So I wonder if you would tell us how understanding this deed and Vitamu's place within the Wampanoag community can alter our understanding of King Philip's War. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's part of the problem in some ways of the name King Philip's War, you know, because it evokes the idea of singularity. Like there's one single prominent leader who leads a rebellion or resists colonization. And we can say lots of things about Metacom and his leadership, but singularity just does not hold up. So I think really reframing not just the war, but our entire understanding of Native space in this region through kinship is really vital because it's really the kinship networks that held people together. And even in the wake of devastating epidemics that came through with those very beginnings of colonization, what leaders did was really try to rebuild through those kinship networks, through creating linkages among the survivors, through renewing relationships of kinship among survivors. And so you both see that before the war, but then also during the war, it was remarkable because at every turn, what I saw in the documents was Native people trying to protect their kin. And regardless of whether a Native person was a scout working for the English forces or whether it was a mother and a leader like Wiedemu, who was responsible for really moving large bodies of people through difficult terrain in order to get to safety and sanctuary, that the motivation over and over again seemed to be the protection and survival of kin. And you can see that operating not just through this war, but long afterwards. Okay, so we've just looked at land as one of the starting points and causes of King Philip's War. And in your book, Our Beloved Kin, you note another starting point. You note that most historians of King Philip's War point to John Sassaman's death and the trial of his accused murderers as the starting point for this war. And after we take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor, I would love for you to tell us about John Sassaman. Did you know that Increase Mather wrote one of the earliest English accounts of King Philip's War? Born in Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1639, as the youngest son of the famed Puritan minister Richard Mather, Increase served as a prominent figure in the colony's early history in his own right. During his lifetime, he served in the colony's government, in the administration of Harvard, and as a judge at the Salem Witch Trials. Plus, Increase Mather wrote several books, including A Brief History of the War and the Indians in New England in 1676. Now, given the importance of the war to New England's history, it's quite possible that, as a boy, Benjamin Franklin may have read Mather's work. We know for certain that his father's small library contained works by Increase's son, Cotton Mather, who was also a famed Puritan minister in Boston. And as Franklin noted in his biography how he read every book in his father's library as a boy, we know that he read Cotton Mather's Essays to Do Good, Plutarch's Lives, and John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Promise, which proved to be one of his all-time favorite books. Would you like to go beyond Benjamin Franklin's reading habits and discover more about the man himself? You can explore Franklin's reading habits as well as many of his other achievements with The Great Courses Plus. In The Great Courses Plus's new course, The Age of Benjamin Franklin, Professor Robert Allison will take you through Franklin's upbringing, his parents, his marriage, who his friends were, his ideas about political philosophy, and his religious beliefs. You can even take the class for free during the free trial The Great Courses Plus will give you when you visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash bfworld. The Great Courses Plus has over 8,500 lectures in its vast library that will help you satisfy your curiosity about history, science, math, psychology, and about how to perform new skills like cooking, speaking a new language, and photography. All of these fascinating lectures are presented by award-winning professors and experts in easy-to-watch 30-minute long videos that you can stream, download, and watch all on your own schedule and on all your favorite mobile devices. So visit 
thegreatcoursesplus.com slash bfworld to learn more about Benjamin Franklin and to delve into new topics just because they fascinate you. To claim your free trial of The Great Courses Plus, visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash bfworld. Lisa, would you tell us about John Sassman? Who was he? How did he die? And why did his death play an important role in causing King Philip's War? Yeah, so John Sassaman has kind of been a favorite figure for a lot of historians. And those of you who read Joe Lepore's landmark work, The Name of War, will recognize his name. And there have been other books that emphasize his role as well. John Sassaman was an orphan of the epidemics. And so he was largely raised in English communities in Massachusetts Colony. And he became instrumental to the English as an adult, in part because of his skills in literacy. So he was often called on to be an interpreter and to be a witness to many of the deeds that we see coming up in the records before King Philip's War. And John Sassaman died months before the war broke out. It was that time of year when it was kind of late winter, the ice was still out, and he at the time was in the Masket territory, which I mentioned previously, and he was on Asplomset Pond when he died. And there was much debate at the time and also among historians about the circumstances of his death. So it is entirely possible that he fell through the thin ice there on the pond and died of drowning or of some other related cause. But his death was used basically as a way to claim jurisdiction over Philip and some of his men. So the colonists accused Wampanoag men of having murdered John Sassaman. And these men were brought to trial, and they were convicted of the murder of John Sassaman. And this was used as a pretext both for the execution of these men, but also for trying to get Philip to come in because they not only blamed these men for killing John Sassman, but they said they were doing it under Philip's orders. So this is kind of the standard narrative of John Sassman's death. And again, there's much debate over his death and the trial. There's a really, well, it's kind of darkly humorous moment when Increase Matter writes about how when Tobias, one of Philip's counselors, appeared before the corpse of John Sasson and the corpse bled, which under colonial beliefs and legal systems was evidence that Tobias was guilty, which, of course, you know, most of the evidence that was used against Tobias in the trial would not hold up in one of our courts today. So it wasn't court in the way that we would think about a trial today. It was very much a court where you were convicted based on evidence that we wouldn't consider evidence. So I want to be clear about that. So when I started writing about this and researching this, I definitely didn't set out to kind of debunk these stories about John Sassman. But what I found that there were documents related to this that were extremely relevant that hadn't really been highlighted. And it became clear that not surprisingly, that land was the motivating factor and that One of the things that was achieved through this court trial was a deed through which some of the colonists could finally claim the central homeland in the Masket, right at Asalamset Pond, where Sassanin was killed. And through the trial, they were able to force a deed for the land. But they also executed the Wampanoag man whom they accused, which, of course, caused huge ripples within that community. And it also really highlights the ways in which the desire for land, as we talked about at the beginning of this conversation, is a motivating factor throughout and a real central cause for the war. You know, as we're talking about the standard narrative and story of King Philip's War, it occurs to me that we haven't really discussed Philip yet. Did you find anything new about Philip's story and whether it has been accurately told over time or... Did you find evidence that might change our views of Philip and who he was? You know, it's interesting because I focused on Philip as really a relative of Wiedemu more than as the central figure of this war. So I think for me, too, Philip becomes a person who is kin to many people. And one of the most important moments for me 
in looking at Philip because I think, you know, he's well known in Wampanoag communities today. And so I think it's important to look at some of the things that he did in the war that don't have anything to do with war, right? In the sense that it's not about battles or raids that he led, but rather looking at his role as a builder of alliance and somebody who understood himself to be operating within these wider kinship networks. And after his community at Montauk was raided by a combined force of the United Colonies, and to be clear, he managed to get all of his people away before they actually arrived at his town in Montauk. But after that, he went to Wiedemu's homeland, where she sheltered many of her own kin. And then after that was raided by English forces, Philip and Wiedemu led many, many families, countless numbers of families, through their territory, and then split from each other in order to seek different sanctuaries and also to kind of confuse, to put the colonial forces off the track, right? So Wiedemu went south to Narragansett territory, and Philip went north to Nipmuc Territory, which is in central Massachusetts. And one of the things that's important about this is that the Nipmucks at the time had already really started their own movement to reclaim their homelands. And this is not to say that all Nipmuc people were involved in that, but there were many Nipmuc communities who were. And they had already created a sanctuary for themselves within their own homeland that was beyond the reach of English colonial forces. And so they sent emissaries down to leave Philip and the Wampanoags who were with him up north into the Nipmuc Sanctuary. And when he arrived there, they counseled with each other. And what's important is that there's a great account that's actually by a Native man who had been with the English forces who was taken captive by the Nipmuc. And he relayed what happened when Philip arrived there in the Nipmuc Sanctuary a place called Menemesis. And he said that Philip took the wampum, he called it, I think, his wampum coat, but it probably was not a coat, but rather a belt or something like that. And he said that he took the wampum and he divided it up amongst the leaders who were gathered there. And this is highly symbolic because the wampum represents both his leadership role as a representative of his nation and community, but also wampum represents binds between communities, between nations. And so really, for me, this was a leader who was conveying that he was not the leader of this war, that this was something that was shared among these different communities and among these different leaders, and that they were actually united in this cause in order to protect their homelands. And that's really what conforms the foundation for these alliances that are built both before and after this war. Now, earlier you mentioned the Nipmuc people in that you mentioned James Printer, a Nipmuc man who ended up at Harvard where he used the first printing press in the colonies. And so I wonder if you would tell us more about James Printer and about the Nipmuc community where he came from. Yes, James Printer, obviously, since I spent so much time thinking about him, is one of my favorite figures in this story. And James was born in the Nipmuc community of Hassanamisit which during his lifetime became a mission community, which was a series of towns, largely in Nipmuc territory, but some in Massachusetts territory. Now, these were towns that had originally been indigenous towns, but they were designated as praying towns by the Massachusetts colony. And so this was an effort by Massachusetts leaders and missionaries to try to convert the Native people, not just to the Christian religion, and the Puritan religion specifically, but also to English styles of living, to English laws, including English gender roles. And so there are ways that this was more or less successful, right? There's lots of ways we can look at the way that these communities continue to exist and practice many of their traditional ways, despite the effort of missionaries to transform them. And so James grew up in this kind of environment. And he also was part of a diplomatic exchange where Nipmuc people were sending some of their sons to live in the English town so that they could better learn the ways of these newcomers so that they could facilitate better diplomatic relations. And that's one of the things that you see in James throughout his lifetime is 
incredible skills in diplomacy and an effort to try to create opportunities for diplomacy. But, you know, at the beginning of the war, he was living in a Nipmuc mission community nearby his home. He was teaching there. He was living in an area where there were many trails and networks that connected all of these communities together. So, you know, he would have been regularly seeing his Nipmuc relatives. And really, his community made clear at the beginning of the war that they had nothing to do with it. You know, they they didn't quite understand why Massachusetts colony, for example, was even getting involved in the war because in the early parts of the war, many neighboring Native nations thought that Plymouth should be left to itself, right? That this isn't a conflict that other people should get involved in. But they also made clear that just because They were Indian people, as the English saw it. That didn't mean that they were going to jump on a bandwagon for war. That wasn't the way things worked. And in fact, they had built up relationships of reliance with Massachusetts colony that they also were trying to honor. But they were trying to honor this through a kind of neutrality. And that quickly shifted. And James Printer, even though he was trying to stay in a position of neutrality and even helping to protect the English settlements near him, he was accused of murdering settlers really early on in the war. And he was actually pinned to a whole group of other Native men who were dragged to Boston, pinned to each other. And they were in prison for about a month before they were allowed to go to trial. And they were nearly lynched. And it came out at trial through the advocacy of both the missionaries and the Mohegans, the neighboring Mohegans, that James Printer and the other men who were accused were actually in church all day when the incident took place. So as you can imagine, this would have been absolutely devastating for James. And even after that, when he returned to his town, he hadn't joined a resistance. He was still just trying to kind of live below the radar. And then his own Nipmuc relatives carried him and the people from his community up into that sanctuary of Menemisa, the same sanctuary where Philip and his people were brought. And it really was for their own protection, because by that time, Massachusetts had instituted a policy towards the praying Indians of total containment. And they had just even interned an entire group of Native people from Natick, which was a mission community that was quite close to Cambridge. They had interned them on an island off in the harbor, and many of those people died of starvation and exposure on this island that was completely deforested and had almost no resources for shelter or food. So really, James Printer was, you know, according to the documents, kind of taken captive both by the English and by his Nipmuc relations. So his was a very conflicted and complicated position. But even when he was with his Nipmuc relations, he managed to really adapt to the situation. And by the end of the war, you see him doing translation and also serving as a scribe for the Nipmuc leaders to communicate their messages. And this is especially true when we see the Nipmuc leaders start moving towards negotiations for a treaty of peace. And you see James Printer becoming a scribe for Nipmuc leaders during this period. So this leads us to a question. How did uncovering James Printer's story change the way you understand King Philip's War? Well, I think one of the really important things about James Printer's story is that it enables us to recognize that for most people, war just shows up at their door and it's a force of utter chaos. And people are really just trying to figure out how to survive and how to enable their kin to survive, right? That oftentimes when you see people write about war, it's focused on military leaders and their strategies, or it's written in a way that it seems like there's clear cause and effect. But most of the people in the world who experience war, they're not in a position of making big decisions. They really are just caught up in the storm of it and trying to figure out ways to survive. And in the end, I think James Printer's story really is a story of survival. And I think it's important because uh, so much of the narrative of King Philip's War has to do with the death of Native people, right? The death of Indigenous leaders, but also the idea of the death of the New England Indians, as if after the war, that's kind of the end of Native New England, particularly in Southern New England. 
And James Church's story really shows us the ways in which people survived. And even after the war, he used the skills that he had to protect the land of Hassanamisa and other neighboring communities. And he continued to be a leader in his community and to try to take steps to protect his kin, even though their lives were really precarious. And also, there were descendants after him who took his last name and who also continued to serve in leadership roles and to try to ensure that their community survived. Speaking of death equaling the end of the war, there actually seems to be a lot of disagreement among historians as to when King Philip's war ended. And a lot of these historians point to King Philip's death as marking the end of the war. But how and when do you think King Philip's war actually ended? Is it really with the death of Medicom? Yeah, this is a great question, and it became a very persistent question for me, is really thinking about the multiple ends of this war. And you're right, there has been a persistent narrative of the war ending with the death of King Philip. And that's not just the actual death of King Philip, but it's kind of a stand-in for the symbolic death of New England Indians. And the wonderful Anishinaabe historian, Gene O'Brien, talks about the prevalence of New England's replacement narratives where you get this ending of Native people and they're replaced with New England colonies. And the war in that kind of narrative really marks the end of Native people and the true birth of the nation in some ways. And this is a really problematic narrative. And besides kind of unpacking those narratives of Native decline and disappearance, I think it's really interesting to look at the documents from the period and the way they completely contradict those narratives. You know, one of my favorite things to talk about and I write about in the book and these last two chapters that really question the ends of war is that on the same day that Philip was pursued to his death by Benjamin Church's forces, there was a raid up in Wabanaki territory in what's now Portland, Maine, then enacted the beginnings of a whole new series of raids on the northern front of the war. And so even this war in particular continues on until 1677 and really doesn't come to an end until the Treaty of Pemquid in 1677 and the Treaty of Casco Bay in 1678. And also, it's important to recognize that, again, this was known as the first Indian War because there were many wars that came afterwards, and indigenous resistance to colonial expansion continued on for nearly another 100 years, as did indigenous diplomacy. And that story of survival and continuance is very vital to understanding the history of New England and the history of the Americas. And when we buy into a narrative that the war or that Indian survival ends in the summer of 1676, then we really elide an entire vast and diverse history of indigenous continuance. You know, I wonder if you would elaborate on some of those points a bit more, because it's clear that many historians believe that King Philip's War was an important event in the history of colonial English North America, and specifically for New England. So would you tell us a bit more about why you think King Philip's War is an important war for us to understand and how you think it may help us better understand early American history and perhaps even something about our own present day? Absolutely. I think the history and the complex questions that are raised by this war are really vital to understanding our collective history here and in thinking about many of the issues that we confront today. For example, we had a conversation about the women's planting fields. The way that Indigenous women were practicing agriculture was sustainable, right? Over hundreds of years, they had very particular techniques that they used. They had techniques that most, for example, organic gardeners would see today as vital to sustaining the soil. But they also had a whole complex of oral traditions and ceremonies and political practices that went along with that, that embedded ideas around the balance of genders, that also embedded ideas about collective decision making and working the land together. And the indigenous languages through which we can more deeply understand things like women's planting 
also tell us that, for example, all of the beings around us, whether we're talking about plants like corn or trees or the various and many animals that share this space with us, that they are animate beings, that they are peoples as we are. They have peoplehood. And again, this is not a kind of romanticized idea at all. This is embedded in the language. And so I think that that is one of the conflicts that you see arise during this period is that the English settlers are coming in with an idea that some people are objects, that animals are certainly objects, and that plants are things to be transformed into foods or to be entirely cleared from the land. You have to understand that at the time they thought that it was ordained by God that they clear the land entirely of trees. And as we know now, that actually causes devastating consequences to the environment that not only impacts the plants and the animals and the waterways, but also impacts human health. And you see those impacts almost immediately coming up in the records in places like Boston, where by the time of King Philip's War already, the water in Boston is not drinkable. Already there's tuberculosis because of living conditions. Already they're facing shortages of wood. So I think there's a lot to be learned from the conflicts that arise during this period and digging deeper into the reasons why they arise. And I think the idea that the English brought with them, the idea of even some people being less than human, right? That that's something we really need to take into account because it is a thread through our collective history. And it's not just applied to indigenous people, but also to people who migrated from other places here. And you often see these narratives used to claim a kind of foundational Americanness when I think it would be really helpful for us to think about how to compare histories in the Americas and how to think about comparisons between indigenous histories and the histories of people who have come from other places and in some ways been categorized in almost identical ways. And I think we can learn a lot from that. And I think it's also really important to conclude in thinking about the continuance and survival of indigenous nations. We need to understand New England and of the continent as a place where indigenous communities, where we still survive and even thrive, and that New England still is a native place. And the more we can do to recover those histories and also to familiarize ourselves with the contemporary native nations that still live here, the better off I think we'll be for thinking towards alternative futures. You know, just as I kind of question any kind of version of the past that's completely contained, I also think we need a lot of different ways to imagine and think about the possible futures that lie before us. Speaking of possible futures, we need to consider a possible past. So why don't we move into the time warp? This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. You argue that histories of King Philip's War, and in fact all discussions of colonial encounters with Native Americans, often contain a sense of fatalism or inevitability in their discussions of indigenous resistance. So I wonder, in your opinion, how might the American origin story look different if we remove from the narrative this idea that Europeans and colonists were destined to defeat Native Americans? Oh, I think that's a great idea. (laughs) We put some things back in. We put the idea of human agency back in, right? Because if things aren't inevitable, then that means that human beings had to enact it. And they had to make very clear decisions that ended up with some of the devastating consequences that we see arising from this war. And then it's important to trace those actions of human agency and the decisions that people made, and maybe even be able to critically analyze those decisions and to think about how it could have gone differently. And I think also that enables us to look at the structures of colonialism. And one of the things that I've learned from interacting with indigenous scholars across the world is that 
the kinds of patterns that we see enacted during King Philip's War, this happens over and over again in many different places. And so the more we can do to kind of analyze those structures so that we can begin to create different structures, maybe renew some more useful structures, but also to be able to see and unpack the structures that still continue and that still influence us in the decisions and the actions that we make and take. I think that's a really important thing to do. And I think that's an important way to learn from our histories. But also, I think then that allows us to imagine many different futures. The Cherokee scholar and novelist Daniel Justice has a great phrase that he says, imagine otherwise. And so I think it's great to look back and think about how we could imagine history otherwise, but it's also really important to think about what are the possible futures that we can imagine otherwise. And one of the alternatives that I sometimes have imagined is looking at one of my favorite sources for King Philip's War, which is the Quaker Rhode Island leader, John Easton's relation of the war which he writes actually in the midst of the war fairly early on, but it doesn't get published until later. And he's really recounting counsel that he had with Philip and other Wampanoag men on the eve of war and really lays out critical indigenous motivations for the war, as well as making clear the ways in which Plymouth, for example, really was aiming to go after Philip and his lands. But even after the war has started, Easton proposes mediation that does not happen. And I often wonder what would have happened if Easton had had more power to be able to envision or imagine otherwise a different relationship between Indigenous people and some of the settlers that came into Indigenous spaces. You know, Easton's Quaker vision was very different from the vision of those firstborn sons in Plymouth. And so I think it matters to look at voices like Easton's as well as figures like Weedmu and James Printer in thinking about both possible past and possible futures. So, Lisa, what aspect of history are you working on now? That's a great question. <laughs> I am actually taking a break. And one of the things that I have as a goal for this summer is to be in the present with my own family and with the trees and the plants that surround us here where I live in the Connecticut River Valley and to reconnect with other family members. And I feel like through much of this book, I felt like I was living in the 17th century. So my goal right now is to renew my relationship to the 21st century <laughs> and where I live. Well, we definitely hope you enjoy living in the 21st century. Of course, some of us may have questions about the 17th century. So how can we contact you if we still have questions about King Philip's War? Well, I think I feel like I have put everything that I had into this book. So I would really invite people to dig into the book, but also to check out our companion website, which is simply ourbelovedken.com. There are many side stories that could not fit into the book. There are also stories that students of mine have developed. There are incredible maps that take you into these places. So if you want to learn more, I urge you to go to that website and to do some traveling in those spaces. Lisa Brooks, thank you so much for spending time with us today and for taking us through King Philip's War and through all the lives of a lot of figures we don't normally hear about. Thank you so much, Liz, for allowing me to talk about some of these stories and the histories. I really appreciate it. We need to understand the North American continent as a place where Native communities lived, thrived, and survived before, during, and after European colonization. And according to Lisa, Studying King Philip's War and developing a better understanding of this event and its many complexities can help us do just that. Most historians have seen King Philip's War as a conflict between the indigenous peoples of New England and the first settlers of New England. They viewed the war as having taken place between 1675 and 1676, and as a war that ended with the death of King Philip, or Metacom, the Wampanoag leader. However, Lisa went back into the archives and found that the sources and documents from the period reveal a much more complex event than historians of the past have been able to see or realize. It was an event that involved a hunger for land, deep cultural differences, many different Native American leaders and people, and many ties of kinship. And as Leeks have found, even the participants in the war knew this to be true, 
as they describe the war not as King Philip's War, but as the First Indian War. Only much later did historians and New England residents start to call the war King Philip's War. So why the change? Lisa believes that over time, historians and New England residents changed the name of the war because by calling it King Philip's War, they could begin and end the narrative of its events around the life of one individual. Telling the story this way makes it easier for people to believe that the disagreement between the colonists and Native Americans was really just a disagreement between the colonists and one Wampanoag man. Plus, if the war ended when Philip died, we don't have to look at the fact that there were other fronts to this war with other Native American peoples. Nor do we have to take notice that the violence didn't really end with King Philip's death. It also means we don't have to talk about certain stories, such as the role that women played in the war. As Lisa revealed, we can read land deeds to show us how English encroachment on Native women's planting fields was a major cause of the war. And if we explore that cause more thoroughly, we might find what Lisa found. Huge differences between English culture and Native American ways. In essence, the past can be difficult to reconcile with, which means it can be tempting to simplify it in ways that ignore complexities of events that may reveal something unflattering about all of our early American forebears. This is why we need to remember that the past happened and history is made. Historians make history with each generation by reading the available evidence and interpreting it in ways that they think make sense. No matter how objective historians try to be, their present always informs their interests in history, how they view historical evidence, and how they interpret that evidence. And as each generation gets more distance from the past, the past feels less personal, which makes it easier to see and acknowledge events and people as complex, and to see and acknowledge aspects of the past that earlier historians couldn't see or didn't want to see. Plus, history isn't a static profession. Techniques for reading and interpreting historical sources also change and evolve over time. Now, frankly, early America is a really hard period to study because it was such a complex, vast place. It was a time and place that involved many different European countries and peoples, hundreds of different Native American peoples and nations, and people from many different African countries, all of whom had different cultures, ideas, and viewpoints that often conflicted and clashed with each other when these different groups interacted. In fact, there were so many different people's ideas and cultures interacting in early America that it could be a hard period for us to wrap our minds around given all the complexities that we know about it, let alone all the complexities that we've yet to see about it. But as Lisa has just shown us, we can see the complex picture of early America quite clearly when we study King Philip's War. When we take the time to look at King Philip's War as the multifaceted, many people event that it was, we can see a manageable example of the many different ideas, viewpoints, and cultures of early America, how and why they clashed, if and how the people of early America were able to overcome their differences, and if they weren't able to overcome them, why they couldn't. These are all ideas that we can use to, as Lisa put it, envision alternative futures for the United States, North America, and all of its people. Look for more information about Lisa, her book, Our Beloved Kin, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 191. Plus, the show notes page is something you definitely want to check out, as that's where you'll find all the details for our upcoming meetups in both Boston and Cleveland in July. So definitely be sure you visit benfranklinsworld.com slash 191. If you are a curious person who would like to know more about just about anything, you should check out The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus has a vast library of over 8,500 different video lectures that you can stream, download, and watch all on your own schedule and on all your favorite mobile devices. To explore courses such as The Age of Benjamin Franklin and many other courses for free during a free trial, visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash bfworld. This episode benefited from the production assistance of assistant producer Holly White. Thank you so much, Holly. Finally, Lisa introduced us to a lot of new information about King Philip's War. What bit of new information, or perhaps a bit of old information, did you find most surprising? I think for me, it was the idea that we really need to consider the more gendered aspects of the war when we look at its causes, which now has me thinking about why we haven't looked at these aspects before now. Anyhow, this is just one of my many thoughts, and I'd love to know what you're thinking. So let me know. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. <laughs> 
Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.